Hello, everyone. Excited to see you. Today, we're going to be hearing from David Q on Jupyter AI. Uh, David's contact information will be available in the slides, and he'll also be out in the hallway in case you have any questions. Thank you. All right. Well, hello, everybody. My name is David Q. I'm a software engineer at AWS. And today, I'm here to talk to you about a Jupyter AI. Um, which is a Jupyter extension that brings generative AI to Jupyter. So in this talk, we will cover, first of all, what exactly is Jupyter AI? And then we'll showcase some of the features that Jupyter AI offers, specifically the Magix interface and a collaborative chat panel in Jupyter Lab. We'll also highlight one of the key features that Jupyter AI offers, which is the ability to actually question files using local retrieval augmented generation. And finally, we'll conclude the segment with the takeaways. So here today, you will learn how Jupyter AI can help you provide uh, code insights, like explaining code and understanding what's actually going on in a notebook. We'll also talk about how Jupyter AI can help you debug failing code. So for example, you have a notebook and it fails and it produces this horribly long tra trace stack and it's very indecipherable. We will discuss how Jupyter AI can help with that. Jupyter AI provides this general interface for interaction and experimentation with the currently available language models, and also even lets you collaborate with other peers and an AI simultaneously in Jupyter Lab. And again, it will, Jupyter AI also allows you to ask questions about local files, which we will demo later. So, first segment, what is Jupyter AI? Well, Jupyter AI is an official project Jupyter extension for generative AI, and it's part of the Jupyter Lab subproject on GitHub. Jupyter AI provides interfaces for model interaction. And to uh, dispel any misconceptions, Jupyter AI itself is not a language model. We did not pay thousands upon thousands of dollars to train our own language model. But instead, Jupyter AI is a human AI interface for, Ju for Jupyter. So to begin, I want to talk about some of the big ideas surrounding Jupyter AI, these ideas that we have been thinking in our heads since the inception and the development of Jupyter AI. And why is another AI ID integration necessary? I mean, this space is very, very, moves very fast, and there are, there are other tools like GitHub Copilot out there. So why Jupyter AI? So the first principle, the first big idea of Jupyter AI is that we wanted Jupyter AI to be vendor agnostic. Jupyter AI should not have a bias towards one specific model or a model vendor. So for example, we should not lock the user into using exclusively open AI models, but instead allow models from other third party providers such as AI21, Anthropic, Cohere, etc. Jupyter AI also needs to be transparent and traceable. The user should always be able to see exactly what prompts are being sent to the model. And furthermore, these need to be traceable. Like they need to be logged somewhere and captured. And a lot of AI ID integrations don't offer that. To a lot of these integrations today are just essentially black boxes that, are, that don't have any transparency or traceability. Jupyter AI also needs to be collaborative. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you keep up with the recent developments in Jupyter Lab, but the latest release of Jupyter Lab 3 and Jupyter Lab 4 support real-time collaboration, very similar to uh, Google Docs. So multiple users can connect to the same notebook and edit it simultaneously and execute cells. And Jupyter AI needs to have to keep that in mind, to, to keep the multi-user scenario in mind. How do you coordinate multiple users and an AI simultaneously? Jupyter AI also needs to be exclusively prompted. And let me elaborate on this. The models should not be run without, without user input. User input needs to happen before Jupyter AI runs any code, it, before it sends a prompt to a model, and just for just for safety purposes, right? It should not be running a model continuously in the background. That would also be very expensive. And finally, Jupyter AI's user interface needs to be human-centered. It needs to communicate. So humans communicate through a lot more modalities than just text. 
And I think that a lot of the limitations surrounding language model research is the simple fact that humans don't communicate exclusively through text. They communicate visually. And the user interface needs to be designed with that in mind. And I, I will show exactly what I mean by this uh, in, later in the presentation. So the first feature that Jupyter AI offers are Jupyter AI magics. So first of all, what are magics? Well, magics in IPython are basically special commands that execute code when they are evaluated in an IPython kernel. So the line magic syntax basically is a single percent sign followed by the command name, then all of the arguments. And that is a single line command. The multi-line command, which we call a cell magic, requires two percent signs, the command name, and then the rest of the arguments can be on the same line or any subsequent lines. So it's kind of analogous to a command line interface that is native to IPython. So here in the uh, screenshot there, I'm running the history magic command, which as, as properly named, shows you the history of these uh, commands that you have run in IPython. And when you execute that cell, that's the output that's shown below. So why Jupyter AI magics? Um, it's a lot, I know a lot of members in this audience haven't even heard of IPython magics beforehand. So the problem now is that users need to experiment with multiple models, but they don't have a unified interface for model interaction. So if you want to use a model, if you want to compare the outputs of a model from AI21 and Cohere and, uh, or, like, or a model on Hugging Face, each of these model providers has a different SDK and a different REST API. It's actually surprisingly difficult to get everything working. And that's not even to mention the issues with authentication and authorization. So to work around this, users are experimenting today in online web playgrounds, like just like ChatGPT, right? Chat.openai.com. But the problem with these is that they don't really produce a reproducible or shareable artifact to collaborate with other developers, right? Like all, to, sh to send the uh, prompts and outputs to another developer, you either have to copy and paste them or you just take a screenshot and send it to them. There's no reproducible or shareable artifact that's produced. And when you create a new session in your web playground, everything is lost, right? And Jupyter AI solves these problems with a surprisingly simple interface that can be used in any IPython context. And by IPython context, this includes Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Lab, VS Code, and Google Colab. So to install the extension, uh, just install it via pip. <laughs> um, the uh, square brackets indicate that uh, you want to install all of the optional dependencies for all of the model providers. And one thing I want to highlight here is that Jupyter AI is modular, extensible, and multi-vendor. So it supports multiple language models from multiple vendors right out of the box. And again, this works with in any IPython context, including Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so there are two installation commands. One is, uh, the top one, uh, is if you want to install everything all at once. And um, this includes the chat panel that is part of the JupyterLab extension. But for users who live exclusively in IPython, you can also install it in a separate package called Jupyter AI Magix, which doesn't include a lab extension and any of the uh, client-side uh, web interface stuff. And to load the extension, it's really simple. Use the load extension magic command, really nice. And um, you can also do a load extension Jupyter AI magics. And the first step here is to authenticate with the model provider. And there are a couple of ways of doing so. Um, one way to do it when starting to, is to do it when starting the server by passing it as an environment variable. So each model provider uh, expects a certain authentic authentication token that can be passed as an environment variable. So this can be done either by adding it to your shell profile or passing it in line on server start. So for example, here, there is an environment variable called anthropic API key, which you might imagine allows you to work with models from anthropic. Um, there's also a way to do this without, act without having to open a terminal at all in notebooks. So you can also use the, uh, the env uh, 
IPython magic to set an environment variable inside your, inside your notebook. Um, the issue with this is that it's a little bit of a security risk because you could be persisting your token and a document that may be shared with your colleagues. So please make sure to, del to delete the cell afterwards to avoid exposing your credentials. And to get started, it, the Jupyter AI offers the uh, appropriately named AI cell magic. So the first line contains all of the arguments, all the subsequent lines are the prompt. And the only required argument that goes in the first line is the provider ID and the model ID delimited by a colon. So here, I'm doing double percent AI Anthropic Cloud V1.2. And what this is saying is call the Cloud V1.2 model provided by Anthropic. And the prompt is, please write a haiku about Jupiter. And here you can see it does actually write a haiku about Jupiter, which is very nice. So to invoke a model, I, I did want to elaborate on the syntax a little bit. So to invoke a model, you need to pass both a provider ID and a model ID. And the, the key idea here is that providers are like interfaces for one or more models. And they're usually restricted to the models of a single parent company. So for example, the Anthropic provider, as you might guess, only provides models from Anthropic. And here I've broken down the syntax a little bit more just to be really, really explicit here. The provider is Anthropic, the model ID is Cloud V1.2. The AI IPython magic also supports the list subcommand, which is done by percent %AI list. And this actually lists the avail currently available models on your instance. Um, so here you can see uh, at the very first row, you can see that the first row is the AI21 provider. And the next column represents the environment variable that specific provider expects. So here you can see that in order to use AI21 models, you need to pass the AI21 API key. And the third column is a very helpful column that just tells you if it's set in your current environment. So if you see all green, you're good. If you see a red X, there's, uh, you, you need to provide the environment variable. And finally, the last column um, lists all of the models that you can use. So here you can see in AI21, you can use J1 large, J1 grand, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of them. Um, and same for Cohere, OpenAI, et cetera. One thing I did want to highlight here is that some providers cannot actually list all of their models because there is an extraordinary number of them. I think the best example of this is Hugging Face Hub, where if you look at the row for Hugging Face Hub, you will see that in the models column, it says this provider does not define a list of models. That's because Hugging Face has an extremely large number of models and there's no way to possibly list all of them in a single viewable uh, table. Um, and in this case, the model ID for Hugging Face Hub is the repo ID. So for example, GPT-2 or Google forward slash flan T5XL. And here we already have an immediate use case, um, which is to rapidly test LLMs. So again, um, testing multiple language models from mul different vendors is actually a bit of a surprisingly tricky problem. And Jupyter AI helps provide a declarative interface for doing so, and also allows you to leverage existing shortcuts built into Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab. So here, if I wanted to compare the outputs of three different models, that traditionally would have involved me, required me to write some Python code that actually calls the Hugging Face Hub inference API. But instead, I can just create three cells in a notebook, command A, shift enter, boom, and then they all run. And I can easily immediately just compare the outputs of these language models and determine which one I would want for my application. So, uh, shamelessly, I have my examples include and uh, are trying to get uh, these models to generate the most effective marketing for AWS. Even though I'm at a Microsoft conference, uh, I have no shame. Um, so here, so you can imagine, like I am a machine learning engineer. I'm trying to find the best model to generate marketing for AWS. And again, I can do this super easily with Jupyter AI. I just run all these cells, compare the outputs, and determine which one that I like the most. Um, probably the first one, um, ironically from Google, but not from Amazon. Um, 
The next feature of Jupyter AI Magix is output formatting. So this circles back to that human-centered design idea that I had talked about earlier, which is that language models generate exclusively text, but humans don't exclusively communicate through text. Humans can communicate visually through like different modalities. So here, with output formatting, you can actually visualize the output of a language model. And a lot of people didn't even know that different language models can generate uh, text in different formats because, because of a lack of visualization tooling. So for example here, in the very first image up above, I'm telling the Cloud V1.2 model to generate a square with, uh, using SVG with a black five pixel border and a white fill. And when I run that cell, to my surprise, it actually renders the uh, it actually renders the square because I explicitly specified via the format argument that the output will be in HTML format. So Jupyter is actually able to render that visually. Um, language models can also output LaTeX. This is a pretty unknown feature of a lot of language models, but they can they can output LaTeX too. So with the uh, dash f math uh, argument, I can specify that this, this language model will output LaTeX markup that represents a math equation, and Jupyter should render it accordingly. So here, I'm telling the, uh, a, this uh, latest and greatest AI21 model, generate me the Schrodinger equation. Um, and it actually, it actually does so correctly, by the way. Um, very nice. And there's also visual capability for JSON. So here I'm asking uh, ChatGPT, generate an example AWS CDK JSON file. And Jupyter does provide a native renderer for JSON files um, to help allow developers to explore JSON trees rather than just receiving a massive block of unformatted JSON text. And the key idea here is that this feature really encourages users to push language models beyond just simple plain text generation and try to get it to generate other output formats. Jupyter AI also supports IPython interpolation. So if you set a variable named, uh, in this case, poet, I'm assigning the string Walt Whitman to the variable poet, and any syntax token wrapped in curly braces will automatically get interpolated. So here, I'm telling, I, my prompt is, here is a poem in the style of poet. And right before uh, Jupyter AI sends my prompt to the, uh, the upstream language model, it will, it will look in the Python namespace and say, hey, is there any variable with the name poet? And it, it says yes. It uh, sees that there was a variable defined, and it will automatically substitute the value of that variable into the prompt. Um, and the reason this is useful is because it allows you to do some pretty interesting stuff with rapid debugging. So here, uh, in the very top, top right, I have a code cell that says assert round 12.5 minus round 11.5 is equal to 1. And if this is false, please throw exception. That's what the uh, assert statement means. And for those unfamiliar, the round function is a standard library Python function that just rounds a floating point to the nearest integer. So to my uh, astonishment, when I run this cell, I actually get this assertion error, which means that this is somehow not true. How could this possibly not be true? You round 12.5, like whether you round it up or down, it should, the difference should always be one, right? So here we can actually use IPython interpolation to help us debug this because by default, IPython automatically caches all of your inputs and outputs into dictionaries for easy referencing. And they are very appropriately named in and out. That's actually what the, um, the number next to every one of the cells in a Jupyter notebook represents. When you run a cell, um, it gets cached into the uh, in dictionary that is indexed by a, a num an integer. So here, I can actually, I can actually ask ChatGPT hey, can you explain why this code, Python 3 code is failing? And then inject the contents of my previous cell into the prompt. So here you can see that in curly braces, I have referenced the in dictionary at uh, index two, which contains the contents of the previous cell I just run. And here, ChatGPT is able to explain to me why this is failing. And it says, 
This is failing because Python 3 uses bankers rounding, which means that odd and even numbers are actually rounded differently to prevent bias. Pretty incredible, I had no idea about that. But um, yeah, and it even, it even goes for the extra credit and it tries to give you some code that, uh, that should pass the assertion. And to my astonishment, when I run that code, it passes as expected. So very impressive stuff. Next, I want to talk about another feature Jupyter AI offers in Jupyter Lab, which is the chat panel. So, how to chat with Jupyter AI? The Jupyter AI package pr automatically provides a lab extension that offers a chat panel in the left sidebar. So, this is the same location where the file browser lives. You just click on the, the button and it opens up a chat panel. And the chat panel allows you to have a conversational interaction with a language model, which previously was usually exclusive to web playgrounds. Um, not, not many people have built these conversational interfaces. Um, and this chat panel also supports uh, LaTeX and Markdown rendering. Really nice. So here, for example, I'm using the Jupyter AI chat panel and asking, what is the 2D Laplace equation? Oh, I, don't, I, sh I sh definitely don't know. And, uh, Jupyter AI gives me a very coherent and well-formatted response, thanks to Jupyter AI. Jupyter AI also supports chat memory built in. And you know, this might not be that exciting to those who exclusively play with ChatGPT, but most language models are essentially what we call one-shot models, or state, they're essentially stateless between invocations. Um, so if you ask a question about cars, and then you receive a response from the model. You ask a follow-up question using the same API, oftentimes it will have no idea what you're talking about because it has no memory of the previous conversational exchange. So what Jupyter AI does is that we are using a third-party library um, for language models called LangChain, and we are using LangChain agents and conversational memory objects to essentially automatically inject the history, the chat history, the transcript, back into the prompt. So even one shot in stateless models will be able to have context. They will, you will be able to ask follow-up questions. So here, in this example, I am asking, can you solve the equation with the finite difference method instead? And if Jupyter AI had, if I was using a language model that was only exclusively stateless and um, only supported one shot inference, the language model would say something along the lines of, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? But thankfully, with the Jupyter AI uh, basically helps the language model remember by injecting the uh, transcript back into the prompt. Um, and this circles back to that idea of being as vendor neutral as possible. Not only are we allowing users to use multiple models, we actually go out of our way to make it easier for users to use multiple models. Jupyter AI chat also supports selections. So um, you can include selections with your prompt or replace an existing selection with the output of a model. Or you can do both simultaneously. Really cool. Um, I tried making this image smaller, um, but it really just, like, it just kind of has to be like this. So please work with me here. Um, <laughs> but on the right side, you can see that I have a notebook open and I selected a cell. And this cell basically visualizes the, uh, the images in my PyTorch training set. And here I select the contents of that cell. And right underneath the uh, chat, chat input at the very bottom, you can see two chat, you can see two checkboxes, include selection and replace selection. And when I click include selection, I can ask a question like, hey, I'm trying to visualize the images in my PyTorch date, uh, training set. Why am I not seeing anything when I run this cell, right? And, I, and before I send the message, I make sure to click include selection, and then I click, and then I, uh, input shift enter and it automatically sends it to the uh, Jupyter AI chat. And you can see there my selection is being included in the prompt. And then Jupyter AI responds, well, it's because you didn't call plot.show. And it actually provides a sample uh, that includes that, that does call that method and that, that code does work. Jupyter AI also supports 
real-time collaboration with multiple users and an AI simultaneously. So Jupyter, so multiple um, users can connect to a Jupyter Lab server and basically play around with the language model simultaneously and in the same chat bar. So when user A sends a message, user B will actually see user A's message in the, um, in the in their respective chat panel. So here, in this example, I have user A, and user A asks for a one-liner that adds the elements of a list together. And Jupyter AI, of course, is able to hand handle such a simple request. But then user B pops into the chat and asks, does that work with Python 2? And Jupyter AI is able to respond to that as well and say, yes, this, this also works with Python 2. So the key, the key idea here is that Jupyter real-time collaboration with Jupyter AI allows peers and coworkers to ask follow-up questions to the prompt that uh, you may have sent. So here is a more fun example. Um, user A asks, why is my configuration not forwarding the host name to the server? And the user is using um, the selection interface to include, this, to include the configuration into the prompt. And then the AI is able to respond uh, with a coherent answer. And then let's say user B also works at the same company connect, and is connected to the same JupyterLab server, but they're based out of France. So then user B asks, pouvez-vous expliquer cela en français? Um, I don't know if I said that correctly. I definitely didn't. Um, and then Jupyter AI is actually able to respond in French. So th this is a really cool and exciting way of getting, uh, uh, this is a really exciting feature because it highlights how c collaboration can really be taken to the next level by adding an AI in between. Like the AI can perform auxiliary functions that your peers may not be able to do so. And the AI is also always available, generally. So there's no worrying about time zones when collaborating with an AI. Jupyter AI also allows you to generate notebooks. Um, this is a really exciting feature that, ca that, um, that we've worked really hard on recently. But you can use the slash generate slash command to generate a notebook based on a prompt. So to use a slash command, it's kind of like Slack or Discord, where you just start your uh, input with the slash command, and then the rest of it are any arguments or the rest of the prompt. So here, in the example, user A asks, generate a notebook that explains how matplotlib works. And then Jupyter AI basically crunches on that, and then actually saves a new notebook in the user's current directory. Um, and the way we're doing this is that the Jupyter AI backend actually decomposes this really complex task into multiple smaller ones. Um, so for example, if you just told a language model, generate me a notebook and give me the entire JSON file all at once, pretty much all language models, maybe with the exception of GPT-4, would fail at that, mainly due to technical limitations concerning um, maximum prompt, prompt size and output size. So what we're doing in the back end is we take this ta we take a complex task and we break it down imperatively and we d we that is all declared in the code itself. So basically there is a separate and each of these like smaller tasks, each of these smaller discrete separate tasks are processed by langchain agents that run in parallel by wrapping the langchain agent in array actor. Now that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of uh, words, but basically what this means is the title, so we first generate the title and the description and, and the outline. And then from that outline, that outline is basically a table of contents, so it has multiple sections in it. And for each of those sections, that now is like this basically stateless task that can be executed in a, in a language model. So th that portion can actually be entirely parallelized which is really, really cool. So to show you, um, this is actually the notebook that was generated using Jupyter AI. Um, as you, you can actually verify that this is a real screenshot because the file names do match. Um, so to highlight the intro, um, so Jupyter AI will generate a title and it will also generate some descriptions. So for example, this notebook was created by Jupyter AI with the following prompt. 
This, again, circles back to the big idea concerning transparency and traceability. We know, like, we go, pro we proactively inform the user when we are generating uh, AI-generated content. And the rest of the notebook looks like this, where each section contains a bunch of code cells that you can run. And these code cells, uh, they do run, and they do provide a visual educational experience for understanding how Matplotlib works, which is really exciting because this has, as you might imagine, tremendous potential in the space of education and software development, right? Like imagine using this to help explain to your peers how a uh, certain Python library works, or use this to, to go to students and explain how, how um, Matplotlib works. Um, and we've actually taken this concept and we've pushed it pretty far. And surprisingly, um, uh, a lot of the current language models are actually able to uh, generate some pretty sophisticated content using this framework. Where again, we are assisting the language model by proactively breaking down a really complex task into smaller ones and sort of guiding the language model to the correct answer. So this is actually available on the GitHub repository under the um, examples directory, where um, one of my colleagues generated a notebook that teaches you how to train a dense neural network with PyTorch. Um, this is way beyond my uh, level of expertise, so very impressive. Um, I did want to. Um, I also want to highlight one of the key features of Jupyter AI, which is the uh, allowing users to question files via retrieval augmented generation. So, quick recap, em embedding models in FICE. So, embedding models at a very, very, very high level uh, base map syntax to a high dimensional vector space that we call an embedding space. And the idea is that once you transform this text into this very like thousand dimensional vector, Nearby vectors indicate semantic similarity, so this can help um, this can help find similar uh, uh, content. So, for example, uh, the embeddings for dog and canine should be very near one another. FICE is a local vector database or approximate nearest neighbor library, depending on how you look at it. This seems like a bit of a controversial topic, so I did give both sides of the argument. And FICE can basically index embeddings, like kind of like a database, really. Um, it can index embeddings and then perform similarity search on another embedding. So for example, I, if I uh, indexed the embedding for a canine and I search dog, it should return the embedding for canine. And the analogy here is that FICE is kind of like a local search engine. All right, indexing files. So you can index a file tree recursively using the slash learn slash command. So the only, required, the only positional argument is the uh, path to the directory from your project root. So here I'm doing slash learn docs, which means that I have a directory in my, in my project root called docs. And this is actually the, this is actually the documentation for Jupyter AI. So if you look at the file path, it's, um, it's my work workspace, and that's actually the Jupyter AI repo, and it's actually indexing the documentation. And then Jupyter AI will respond asynchronously, I have indexed uh, all the documents, and I'm ready to answer questions about them. So what happens here is that files are embedded via an embedding model, and then we index them via FICE. And FICE runs locally, by the way, so that's another really nice thing. It, it's free, and it's the best price, really. So, questioning the index. So, you can use the slash ask uh, slash command to tell Jupyter AI, hey, please use this index when answering my next question. So, so what happens here is that when you send a prompt, the prompt gets uh, embedded via a, a um, embedding model, and then FICE performs a similarity search to find relevant uh, search results from all of the index documents in your fi file tree. So, so for example, I, uh, here I'm asking Jupyter AI about Jupyter AI, which is pretty meta. Um, what is Jupyter AI and how can I install it? And keep in mind that if you tried this with ChatGPT right now, it would completely fail on you. 
And why is that? It's because language models typically have a cutoff date for their training data. So the one for ChatGPT, I believe, is sometime in mid-2021. So anything after that, ChatGPT has absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Um, but here, because we previously indexed all of the documentation for Jupyter AI, we can ask it questions about things it wouldn't have known about. So in other words, we are doing, we are proactively providing context to the language model to help. Um, so <laughs> taking this concept a bit further, you can also ask some, I've uh, experimented with this and it's actually pretty smart. So, for example, here I'm saying, I'm getting an unauthenticated exception when trying to run a cell magic. What authentication am I supposed to provide when using the OpenAI provider? And if you didn't read the documentation, this might be a little vague, but Jupyter AI is able to respond within a second and say, you need to specify the OpenAI API key. And it gathered this information by reading our documentation. Another and here you see another example, how do I get Jupyter AI to render output with LaTeX when running a cell magic? And we discussed this earlier, but in case you forgot, Jupyter AI can also uh, tell, you, tell you about all about it again. All right, so takeaways from this talk. Jupyter AI can provide code insight. It's very good at explaining code, especially if you index them to local files. Um, it can debug failing code very easily thanks to magics and uh, selections and all sorts of utilities we're providing to users. Um, Jupyter AI essentially is best described, if you had to describe Jupyter AI in a single sentence, Jupyter AI it provides a general interface for interaction and experimentation with currently available language models. And Jupyter AI allows you to collaborate with both peers and a language model simultaneously in JupyterLab, which as we have shown is actually pretty powerful for certain applications. So what's the future of Jupyter AI? Well, we're working very hard on multimodal support. Oh, <laughs> multimodal model support. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of words. Um, so for example, text to image or image to image, right? Um, not, just, not just text to text, but pushing like trying to play with some other generative AI models that aren't just LLMs. Um, it would also be really cool if Jupyter AI could index upstream documentation. So for example, imagine a world where you could have a conversational interface to any Python library that you're using just by providing the name of the PyPy package and then Jupyter AI goes to that website, finds the documentation page, indexes it recursively, and then is able to ask, answer questions about it. Um, we're also, working on, we're also working on model configurability in the chat. Right now, we are using the um, exclusively the open AI models for both the embedding and the, uh, and the, uh, the language model that's powering the uh, chat panel. Um, the reason we're doing this is because right now, there were still a few issues with regards to how we're generating the prompt that not basically Different models kind of communicate differently uh, depending on how they're trained. And for some of these more complex tasks, uh, we're still working on uh, making, making it better for different uh, language models. And we're also working on much more. Um, so here is a, a brief, very brief uh, beta. Uh, I actually just reviewed this pull request yesterday. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, and uh, we're already working on multimodal models just to um, put my money where my mouth is, right? So uh, please check us out, GitHub. Um, it's, again, it's under the JupyterLab subproject. That's how you know it's official. Um, well, I guess you can't really click that link, but like, try your best. Um, and uh, documentation, um, jupyterai.readthedocs.io, awesome stuff. Um, Acknowledgements. Thank you to my team at AWS. My manager is Brian Granger. You may have heard of him. He is the co-founder of Project Jupiter. Really awesome guy. And I also like to thank my teammates and co-workers at AWS, um, Jason, Piyush, and Andre. They've all contributed an enormous amount of effort into this. Um, yeah, so just big thank you to all of them. And thank you to the audience for being here. Thank you.